chapter 6. Now, were the enemies of Nehemiah happy? No. They still are not happy. They still want to put asunder God's work. They want to bring it down. So they have got <coughs> new tactics. They want to uh, stop the world. They want to distract Nehemiah. They want to disrupt the world. They want to cause uh, 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 people to be depressed and so on. So, let's look at chapter 6. Now, it happened when San Balat. But anyway, do you all see this picture? I took this photograph many years ago. <coughs> no, it's not nice from the internet. Okay. Uh, gr some graphic um, pictures of how they labored as they work on the walls. Now, it happened when Sanbalat Tobiah, Sanbalat was who? The governor of Samaria, right? Across the river, beyond the river. Tobiah was the Ammonite, who Ammonite, they are on the east of River Jordan. Jeshem, the Arab, so you have north, you have east, you have Arab, the south. And the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall and that there were no bricks left in it. Because after they built, they have to join the walls, right? Seal them up. And there were no bricks in it. Though, and this is the honesty of Nehemiah, though at that time, I had not hung the doors in the gates. They were building, building, building. But the finale is when they hang the door in the gates and then they put the bolts and the bars right close the gate that is so he, in other words the walls have not been completed but yet the enemies were saying to others that he had rebuilt the wall and there were no breaks in it verse 2 that Sanbalat and Jeshem sent to me saying come let us meet together among the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me harm. So where is the plain of Ono? You know? Oh no. You catch it, you don't catch it. So, this is the, almost the, the mid section of Israel, and this is Jerusalem. This area is Judea, up here is Samaria. Eight C is here, River Jordan is here. Are you all able to follow? Those who've been to Israel? If not, then uh, October I'm going again. Okay? And then Jerusalem here. So to the northwest of Jerusalem, where this is the Mediterranean Sea, Chopa is here. So this is Omo. Okay? Ashok is another Philistine uh, place. This is Arabia. This is the Negev Desert in the south, and Arabia is here. Okay, are you oriented? So, what did they want to do? They said to him, "Let us meet together among the villages in the plain of Ono." The first tactic that they wanted, the first tactic that they wanted to do unto Nehemiah was to, number one, distract him. Distract him. Take him away from the area of work. Because he's busy supervising and looking after the job. So take him far away. And let us meet in the villages. But Nehemiah was smarter than that. Perhaps they might want to harm me there. You follow me? Now? And then his great answer. He was not compromising in his attitude. His great answer is, I am doing a great work. I sent messengers to them saying, I am doing 
a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? You notice, go down, go down. Because when you go to Jerusalem, you are always going up. When you leave Jerusalem, you are going down. Because this is where the house of God is. You know, on higher ground. So I'm doing a great work that I cannot come down. You know what the enemy wants? The enemy wants to eat your time. While you are occupied, you have great intentions of doing certain projects, certain work, certain ministry and so on. Then you find that the devil will come and distract you and, and, and tell you, you know, maybe there are other things you can attend to. Maybe you can just leave this aside for a while and try to help me in this and, and that and so on. Stay focused. Don't let the devil distract you. Anyway, if he goes there, it could be a very dangerous trip. His life might be in danger. But what you see in this person is he was uncompromising. God has sent me to come and build the wall. And this is what I'm doing. Nothing else. Okay. So for the early years, when we came, if you, if you talk to your dear pastor today, also my pastor, he <laughs> lived, he breathed, he dreamed, he, everything like, is what? Protester. Protester. People ask him, hey, can you come and preach at our church? You know, can you come and do this? Visit him? No, no, no. He was so focused to building the church at number 30 Chachi Street. Okay, so stay focused. But they sent me this message four times. They didn't give up the, the, the enemies. They sent him email four times. And I answered them in the same manner. That means each time they sent a letter to him, he answered them. And this is what? Diplomacy. After all, Sambalan was the governor of Samaria beyond the river. He is still, in terms of status and protocol, higher. So that also tells us uh, we cannot be gangsters, you understand? We, we must still respect the authority of the land. And so he did. But some people, they think uh, in the name of Jesus, they can do anything. No, it is not so. So he responded. Then Sambalat, he was persistent, right? Sent his servant to me as before the fifth time with an open letter in his hand. In it was written. It is reported among the nations and Chishen says that you and the Jews plan to rebel. Therefore, according to these rumors, you are rebuilding the wall, that you may be their king. And you have also appointed prophets to proclaim concerning you and Jerusalem, saying, There is a king in Judah. Now, these matters will be reported to the king. That means king of Persia, reported to the king. So come, therefore, let us consult together. First, they attempted to distract him. Didn't work. Secondly, their attempt to incriminate him. To incriminate him. To throw an accusation against him. You are building this wall because you want to become king. You, you have hired prophets. Of, that means what? You, you have uh, paid prophets uh, to speak all this prophecy that there shall be a king in Jerusalem and you are going to be the one when you build the wall now this is not new you remember in Israel chapter 2 oh no chapter 4 Israel chapter 4 when Israel was building the temple he also had enemies right they also came and they, 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 they say, Oh, you are doing this uh, because it is for your own benefit. Isra chapter 4, verse 12. And those days, Isra's days, the enemies were Rehom, verse 9, Rehom, the commander, Shimshai, and 
and so on and so forth. Yeah. And in verse 12, the letter that was sent out accusing Israel, verse 12, let it be known to the king that the Jews who came up from you have come to us in, at Jerusalem and are building the rebellious and evil city and are finishing its walls and repairing it, the foundations. Let it now be known to the king, if this city is built and the walls completed, they will not pay tax, tribute or custom, and the king's treasury, the Persian king's treasury, will be diminished. Nothing new. But anyway, that, that point in time in Israel chapter 4, after the letter went, King Artaxerxes stopped the work, right? <coughs> stopped the work. That's why when Nehemiah came, it was because the place was still in ruins. That's why he came to be healed. So, to Nehemiah, this is not new. This is a threat, yeah. I, I read it, you know, Nehemiah read the thing as a threat. But he did not bother. Verse 8. Then I sent to him saying, no such things as you say are being done, but you invent them in your own heart. He didn't even bother to prove to them. He didn't even bother to waste time. He just said, no such thing. Okay. He was definitely still loyal to King Artaxerxes because at the end of 12 years, he went back to King Artaxerxes. He was loyal. So, don't waste time with the enemies. They try and distract you, ignore them. Then they try and throw accusation. They say, you know, you, you are doing this, you are doing this. Perhaps you've got your own motivation, you've got your own motive, you've got other agenda and so on. Just ignore them. And I tell you, the higher you go, the more of such arrows will land on, your, on you. Sometimes they miss and land, land on your table, but it still lands on you. I've got quite a few of this. They question my intention. Why I do Saturday Bible study, why I go mission, and so on. But never mind. No such things. That's what I say to them. Okay, anyway, verse 9. For they all were trying to make us afraid. That's what they wanted to do. Put fear in the people, saying, their hands will be weakened in the work and it will not be done. So what they want to do is put fear in them so that they are so fearful that they will not continue to work. Now, fear is a natural reaction or response to situations around you. It's okay. Because we are only human. Yeah. Suddenly, you, 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 you are surprised by a very uh, threatening thing. Of course, there's fear. But if fear overtakes you, and leaves you immobile, you can't think, you can't walk your whole life in this array, then I think it is sad. It shouldn't be. Okay. So you, you must still remember that you are a child of God. Your dependence is upon Him. Yeah? He will surely come and save you. So, now therefore, O oh God, strengthen my hands. The thing about Nehemiah is anytime anyone upsets him, distracts him, disrupts him, <coughs> he turns to Papa. You understand? So do the same thing. If you are ever in any difficult situation, turn to Apple Father. He turned to God and said, Strengthen my hands. Afterward, I came to the house of Shema Ayer, the son of Dela Ayer, the son of Mahit Tabel who was a secret informer. Who was a secret informer. Now, who was Shehemiah? Shemaiah, Shemaiah. Some say he was a priest. Some say he was a prophet. But a false prophet we shall see. Whether false prophet or, or priest, no good. Not a good guy. He was a secret informer. But wait, before then, just now we came across this guy called Jishem, right? In verse 6, he was reported amongst the nations and Jishem says, 
that you and the Jews plan to rebel. Therefore, according to the rumors, you are building the wall and blah, blah, blah. You know what is a Jishem? Jishem is a rumor monger. Jishem is a gossip king. Every church has one. At least one. You know, they go around, they don't get involved, they don't contribute to the the ministry, but they like to gato, they like to gossip, they like to pass rumors. Every group of one. And in the corporate world, this gives rise to a lot of corporate politics. Who is after whose position and who is not happy with who and who wants to terminate who and who wants to... Uh. So don't be surprised. Every organization in the world and in the church, there is a Jishan. So if you see one, name him. Jishan. Okay. okay, but now we look at Shema Aya, the secret informer. And he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple and let us close the doors of the temple for they are coming to kill you. Indeed, at night they will come and they will come to kill you. What did Nehemiah say? And I said, should such a man as I flee? And who is there such as I who will go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. Now, question. Who can go into the temple? Okay. Only the priest. Nehemiah was not a priest. He was just a layman. Now, so, Shema Ayah, to suggest that, let us go into the house of God. Possibly, he was a priest. But some Bible studies say that he was a prophet. But he suggested, let's go into the house of God. To what? To take refuge. Because the enemies are coming to kill Nehemiah. Let's go there and hide. Now, in the, you know, we study kings, we study chronicles and so on. There was a little boy, the king. Yeah. In those days, only the king or the pretender to the king. That means not so good. But, okay, anyway, the king, if he is under threat, he can go into the temple and hide. Okay? He can go into the temple and, and hide. But other than that, no one else. If someone else goes in, then if he's not the king, then he's the pretender to the king. To be king, like maybe he, he desires to be king. He just wants to wait there. So if... Minimaya had taken this advice and had gone into the house of God. Then his enemies would be more than ready uh, to say, See, I told you, he had his desire to be king, and now he is in the house of God. He definitely has planned to be king. But Nehemiah knew. That's why he said, Should such a man as I flee? Who is there, such as I, who would go into the temple to save his life? Not me. I am not king. Neither am I a priest that I should go in. So the third tactic that the enemies were throwing at Nehemiah, number one was to uh, distract him. Number two was to incriminate him. The third one was trying to isolate him. So since he did not agree to go to Ono, right? Far away. Okay, la, then we keep him in Jerusalem, but keep him in the house of God. Chances are, if he had gone in, you know what they do? They lock the door and throw the key. Possible, right? If they are evil, they could even attempt such a thing. But he had spiritual discernment. Verse 12. Verse 11, he said, I will not go in. Then I perceived that God had not sent him at all, but that he pronounced this prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sambala had hired him. This is spiritual discernment. 
you can call it work of knowledge or whatever. But this can only come about if you have a close relationship with God. And this Nehemiah had always been talking to God, right? Praying to God, had communion with Him. Last Saturday at the, the, the Saturday Encounter Service, I preached, I expounded on the theme verse. 1 Samuel chapter 3, 9 and 10. In fact, I expounded the whole chapter. I find it difficult to just preach one verse because you need to know the whole context. So I normally preach from the text. So I did the whole chapter. So that you understand why was the word of God rare in Israel those days? Why is it rare in your life? How receptive was Samuel to the word of God when God spoke to him? How receptive are you to the word of God? What impact did the word of God have on Samuel and then on the nation of Israel? Because he heard the word of God, he received the word, he responded. And I challenge the people that they too will find impact in their lives as they receive the word of God, as they res uh, 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 respond to the word of God. Not only on them, but also on the community around them. Their family, their ministry, their place of work, their marketplace, the church, and so on and so forth. And so this Nehemiah had discernment because he had a relationship with God. Verse 13. For this reason, he was hired that I should be afraid and act that way and sin. So that sin is because if he had gone into the temple, it that is sin. Okay? So that they might cause have cause for an evil report that they might reproach me. So they will quickly send a report to Persia. See, I told you, he has desire to be king. So as usual, not surprising. Nehemiah turned to God. My God, remember Tobiah and Sambalat according to this, their works and, their, and the prophetess Noah Dyer and the rest of the prophets who would have made me afraid. All these other false prophets. I mean, we all have a circle of friends, right? Nehemiah had a circle of enemies. No fun. Prophetess and prophets all against you, together with Tobiah and Sambala. Anyway, he committed the matter to God and then went on working. And so, verse 15. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of Elul. In 52 days. Elul is the sixth month. Elul is the sixth month in the Jewish calendar. Now, they completed the walls in 52 days. Actually, all in all, within six months, uh, from the moment he heard the bad news when he was up in Persia, then he prayed, then he got permission from the king, and he came down. And immediately, he went to recce the place that night, and, and then he, the, he started the work. Within 52 days, in 52 days, he completed the work. So in less than six months, between five and six months, he completed the wall. Now, the wall wasn't the high, high wall. It was like half high. Still, if you go to Israel and you walk the whole city, as we have, not an easy task. You've got to clear the rubbles, you've got to you know, motivate the people, make sure the resources are there, they have food, and then at the same time, one hand fighting, the one hand weapon, one hand working. Not easy. So, it can only be what? By the grace of God. It only can be that God, God caused these walls to be rebuilt through His people. So it was a miracle. So in 52 days, and verse 16, and it happened when all our enemies heard of it and all the nations around us saw these things, they were very disheartened in their own eyes. For they perceived, that means what? Using their mind, 
they see Paul. For they perceive that this work was done by our God. Of course what? This is the God of Israel, of His chosen people. And when they heard, wow, this bunch of fellows crossed the Red Sea and they survived. Not only crossing, but also in the desert 40 years. They get frightened. That means uh, we are not fighting them, no, we are fighting God. God is on their side. So they were afraid. They were also afraid that with this success, then Judah, Judah, Jerusalem, they will go on to be a great, powerful city. And they can be a powerful nation again in the future. So this was what they didn't want. But you cannot go against the plans of God. Verse 17. Also, in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah. And the letters of Tobiah came to them. Tobiah is the Ammonite, eh? enemy. Eh? For many in Judah were pledged to him because he was the son-in-law of Shekhar, Nair, the son of Ara, and his son, Jehohanan, had married the daughter of Meshulam, Meshulam, the son of Barakiah. Also, they reported this good deeds before me and reported my words to him. Tobiah sent letters to frighten me. Do you understand this passage? It is called divided loyalty. Okay. So let me highlight this. There is, there was Tobiah the Ammonite, right? Enemy, right? And then there is this group of people called the nobles, the rich people of Israel. God say, marry or don't marry. Don't marry. You are Jews. This one, Ammonites, are enemies of Israel. But there is this rich guy here. His name is Shekaniah. Shekaniah. Tobiah married his daughter. You know, for any reason you can think of. Maybe for commercial reason. Okay, You are noble, rich, Tobiah enemy. Yeah. But if you can befriend him, maybe you can still continue to live a good life. So never mind, you can have my daughter Mary. Okay? So this is first in the marriage. Then from this marriage, Tobiah and the daughter, they had a son. And the son was called Jehohanam. And Jehohanam married the daughter of Meshulam, the son of Barakiah, another Jew. So again, mix. So, this son of Tobiah married another noble's daughter in um, Israel, in Judah. So, all this uh, caused you to be in a compromising situation. So, what you read, verse 17, the rich people, the nobles of Judah, sent many letters to Tobiah. So they sent letters to Tobiah, uh, telling them what, misreporting and reporting to Tobiah, what Nehemiah and the people had done. Because they got to be, they are chinke, right? They are also got to be, he is, he's also like an enemy, but he's also a high position. So reported to him. So they sent many letters to Tobiah, and the letters of Tobiah came to them. For many in Judah were pledged to him, pledged in loyalty to Tobiah. Because you know why? Enemy. Because also he was a son in law of Shechaniah, the son of Arab, and his son Jehohanan had married the daughter of Meshulam, the son of Barakiah. Now you understand. Now you understand. That's why even in Israel, book of Israel, when we studied chapter 9 and 10, Israel was so angry. Don't intermarry. God already said don't intermarry. And he actually sent those foreigners away. I know wife and kids are, yeah, you know, uh, they, they, they are pitiful, but he sent them away. He had to separate God's people to themselves. 
Because when you have one foot in the world and one foot in the church, where is your loyalty? Yeah, you either God or heaven, not both. And verse 19, they also, these are the nobles, they also, and also they reported his good deeds before me. You know what they're trying to do? Double-headed snake, you understand? Double-headed. So one, one side, they reported Nehemiah's stuff to Tobiah. But then they also reported Tobiah to Nehemiah. But only the good deeds are, you know, to, Tobiah good, not Tobiah. You know. yeah. And they reported his good deeds before me. What about his bad deeds? Nothing. Okay. And reported my words to him. And Tobiah, what did Tobiah do? Still. Yeah. Tobiah sent letters to frighten me. Now, by now, the wall has been completed. You have seen the miracle and still <coughs> wants to challenge and want to frighten Nehemiah. By then, uh, you should know, okay, hello, the God of Israel is alive. He is the defender of the people of Israel. And yet, uh, they still want to go against the people of God. It is still happening today. Okay? That is chapter 6. 